All right, this is, this is happening. Um, hi, and welcome to the 2023 Annual Conference and Book Fair in Seattle, Washington. I am Michelle Aielli, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. Here is a visual description of myself. I am a white female with very dark and very curly hair. In homage to my New York people, I'm wearing black pants, a black shirt, and a black jacket. The Association of Writers and Writing Programs is a small but mighty nonprofit organization that amplifies the voices of writers and the academic programs and organizations that serve them, all while championing diversity and excellence in creative writing. I am a member of AWP's Board of Directors, but first and foremost, I am a member of AWP. Membership with AWP provides me with writing resources year round, but just as importantly, it allows me to support other writers, especially those who are just starting out. My membership dues help writers find meaningful careers and publication opportunities and make services like the Writer to Writer Mentorship Program possible. If you aren't already, I invite you to become a member today. We are delighted to bring you this event. Jane Wong is an absolute, absolute genius and I'm personally so pleased to share this experience with my friend Lindy West, <laughs> whose books I am distinctly honored to publish. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our conference sponsors and the literary partner hosting this event, Seattle Arts and Lectures. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. Please join me in thanking all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. Now, before we, oh, yay. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Now, before we start, some brief housekeeping. Please silence your cell phones. Remember, there is no flash photography allowed during the presentation. Respect seats marked as reserved for attendees with accessibility needs. The authors will sign books after the event. The signing table is in the hallway right outside the ballroom. After the presentation, please exit to the signing table and please give the authors about 10 minutes to get to the table before approaching them to have your book signed. Lastly, we ask that you please be aware of your fellow attendees who may have disabilities and help AWP be more accessible. Specifically, if you see a barrier to accessibility, let us know by calling or texting, texting our accessibility hotline at 240-269-6635. Please also be aware of those with invisible disabilities and do not question someone's use of an accommodation. Thank you very much, and now it's my great pleasure to welcome Rebecca Hoogs, who will introduce this fantastic event. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Hoogs, and I have the great pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Seattle Arts and Lectures. It is an honor to be a partner of AWP and to present today's panel featuring hometown literary heroes Lindy West and Jane Wong. <laughs> the mission of Seattle Arts and Lectures is to cultivate transformative experiences through story and language with readers and writers of all generations. We do this by presenting authors like Lindy and Jane on our stages here in Seattle and beyond through streaming. We invite you to stay in touch by tuning into Sal wherever you are. We also engage with young writers through our Writers in the Schools and Youth Poet Laureate programs. Please visit booth, our booth in the book fair or go to our website at lectures.org to learn more about opportunities to teach in our programs or attend our programs. Lindy and Jane will both open the program today by reading briefly from their work and then that, a conversation will follow. It's now my honor to introduce both authors. Lindy West is a former contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and the author of Shit Actually, the definitive 100% objective guide to modern cinema, as well as the New York, New York Times bestselling memoir, Shrill, Notes from a Loud Woman, and the essay collection, The Witches Are Coming. She is a writer and executive producer on Shrill, the Hulu comedy adopted from her memoir, and co-wrote and produced the independent feature film, Thin Skin. Her work has also appeared in This American Life, the Guardian, Cosmopolitan, GQ, Vulture, Jezebel, and others. She is the co-founder of the reproductive rights destigmatization campaign, Shout Your Abortion. Jane Wong is the author of How to Not Be Afraid of Everything from Alice James Books and Overpour from Action Books. Her debut memoir, Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City, is forthcoming from Tin House this May. 
She is an associate professor of creative writing at Western Washington University and a scholar of Asian American poetry and poetics. Her poems and essays have been published in the Best American Non-Required Reading, 2019, the Best American Poetry, the New York Times, McSweeney's, Black Warrior Review, and many more. The recipient of the James W. Ray Distinguished Artist Award for Washington Artists, her first solo art show after preparing the altar, The Ghosts Feast Feverishly, was exhibited at the Fry Art Museum in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Lindy West and Jane Wong. And up first to read will be Lindy West. Am I reading up there? At the oh, I can just sit here? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> this seems cooler. Um, okay, so a couple things. Okay. Um, uh, I grabbed Shrill to read from because I don't have a new book. And um, I was like, I'll read some Shrill. That's fun. I've, and I haven't looked at this book like this came out in 2016 and I don't remember what's in it. So this is gonna be fun. And I don't remember what I used to read from, so I'm just gonna read the first chapter. And also I just realized that I grabbed the British version. Oh my God. So it's possible that it'll be like, Lori, crisps, I don't know. <laughs> like they change it, they change stuff to make it British. So that, that'll be uh, jolly good, I guess, <laughs> if that happens. Okay. Um, so this chapter, oh, and this is a chapter about fat representation in media, which feels relevant right now because I just wrote many thousands of words about um, Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, The Whale, um, which is not good, and um, you shouldn't see it, and it's bad. And um, so nice to know that this thing that I wrote in 2015, really, uh, still applies. Eight years later, nothing's changed. In fact, perhaps it's worse. Okay, um, this chapter is called Lady Cluck. Why is what do you want to be when you grow up the go-to small talk we make with children? Hello, child. As I have run out of compliments to pay you on your doodling, can you tell me what sort of niche you plan to carve out for yourself in the howling existential morass of uncertainty known as the future? Also, has anyone give you a, given you a heads up that everyone you love will die someday? That's like waking a dog up with an air horn and telling it that it's president now. I don't know, Uncle Jeff. I'm still kind of working on figuring out how to handle these weird ice pops. <laughs> Popsicles with the two sticks. You know how there's like, why did they make those? Where you have to break it in half? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there was a time, uh, I'm told, when I was very small that I had a ready response. The answer was ballerina or for a minute, veterinarian, as I had been erroneously led to believe that veterinarian was the grown-up term for a professional animal petter, I would later learn that it's more a term for touching poop all the time, featuring intermittent cat murder, so the plan was abandoned. <laughs> the fact that any kid wants to be a veterinarian is bananas, by the way. Whoever does veterinary medicine's PR among preschool-aged children should be working in the fucking White House. Um... Then I go on about all the jobs that I didn't want to have, and then I get to the fun part. Um, as a kid, I never saw anyone remotely like myself on TV, or in the movies, or in video games, or at the children's theater, or in books, or anywhere at all in my field of vision. There simply were no young, funny, capable, strong, good fat girls. A fat man can be Tony Soprano. He can be Dan from Roseanne, still my number one celeb crush. Uh, he can be John Candy, funny, without being a human sight gag, but fat women were sexless mothers, pathetic punchlines, or gruesome villains. Don't believe me? It's cool, I made a list. Here is a complete list of fat female role models available to me in my youth. Lady Cluck. Lady Cluck was a loud, fat chicken woman who took care of Maid Marian uh, and presumably may have wet-nursed her with chicken milk in Disney's <laughs> Robin Hood. Lady Cluck was so fat, in fact, that she was nearly the size of an adult male bear. Being a 400-pound chicken, she wasn't afraid to throw down in a fight with a lion and a gay snake, uh, even <laughs> though the lion was her boss, hashtag lean in, and <laughs> she had monstro jugs, but in a maternal sexless way, which is a total ripoff. Like, she doesn't even get to have a plus... Oh, God, I can't believe I wrote this. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry for this sentence that I could skip, but I'm not. It says, like, she doesn't even get to have a plus-sized fuck fest with Baloo. Why did I 
wrote that. <laughs> my God. I was so like gonzo in my 20s. Okay. I guess I was in my 30s when I wrote this. Never mind. Uh, okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, number two. Baloo dressed as a sexy fortune teller. In order to assist Robin Hood in ripping off Prince John's uh, bejeweled caravan, Baloo adorns himself with scarves and rags and golden bangles and whirls around like an impish Scirocco, utterly beguiling PJ's guard rhinos and incapacitating them with boners. <laughs> Baloo, <laughs> this is very, is this niche Disney's Robin Hood? It's not, right? It's a huge corporation. Um, Baloo dressed as a sexy fortune teller luxuriates in every curve of his huge, sensuous, bare butt. Self-consciousness is not in his vocabulary. He knows he looks good. The most depressing thing I realized while making this list is that Baloo dressed as a sexy fortune teller is the single most positive role model of my youth. <laughs> the Queen of Hearts. I do not even know this bitch's deal. In Alice in Wonderland, her only personality trait is likes the color red. She doesn't seem to do any governing aside from executing minors for losing at croquet. And she is married to a one foot tall baby with a mustache. <laughs> mm, she is, now that I think about it, the perfect feminazi caricature. Fat, loud, irrational, violent, overbearing, and constantly hitting a hedgehog with a flamingo. Okay. Um, I mean, I can't read them all. Uh, the sexual tree from The Last Unicorn. Um, that one's niche, maybe. Uh, Miss Piggy. Okay, I'm deeply torn on Piggy. For a lot of fat women, Piggy is it. She's powerful and uncompromising, assertive in her sexuality, and wholly self-possessed with an ostentatious glamour usually denied anyone over a size eight. Her being a literal pig affords fat fans the opportunity to reclaim that barb with defiant irony. She invented glorifying obesity. But also, you guys, I can't believe I wrote this. Miss Piggy is kind of a rapist? Maybe if you love Kermy so much, you should stop literally chasing him? He is physically running away from you. It's uncomfortable and it's wrong. Um, okay. Marla Hooch from A League of Their Own. Oh, poor Marla. Oh, the neighbor with the arm flab from The Adventures of Pete and Pete. A deep cut, perhaps, but <laughs> Big Pete and Little Pete spent an entire episode fixated on the jiggling of an elderly, uh, an elderly neighbor's arm fat. Next, I didn't wear a tank top for 20 years. So true. Um, we'll just do a couple more. Um, Ursula the Sea Witch. The whole thing with Ariel's voice and Prince Ambien overdose is just an act of civil disobedience. What Ursula really wants is to bring down the regime of King Triton. Footnote, I have some questions about King Triton. Specifically, <laughs> King, why are you elderly but with the body of a teenage beast master? How do you maintain those monster pecs? Do they have endocrinologists under the sea because I am scheduling you some blood tests? <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, uh, she wants to bring down the regime of King Triton so she and her eel bros don't have to live uh, in their dank hole tending their garden of misery slime for the rest of their lives. It's the same thing with the Lion King. Why should the hyenas have to have a shitty life? History is written by the victors. So forgive me if I don't trust some steroidal... <laughs> okay, that's a British change. I remember this because I was proud of it. It used to say P90X Sea King, <laughs> which is... Um, Infomercial, it's like a fitness, never mind, I guess steroidal is better. If I don't trust some steroidal sea king smear campaign against the radical fatty in the next grotto. Um, and then we'll close on Mrs. Potts. Question, how come when the teapot and the cup turn back into humans at the end of Beauty and the Beast, Chip is a four-year-old boy, but his mother, Mrs. Potts, is like 107? <laughs> Perhaps you're thinking, Lindy, you are remembering it wrong. That kindly white-haired snowman-shaped Mrs. Doubtfire situation must be Chip's grandmother. Not so, champ. She's his mom. Look it up. She gave birth to him four years ago. <laughs> also, where is Chip's dad? Could you imagine being a 103-year-old single mom? <laughs> I'm really cool. I, anyway, and then I just complain about how the, those were my options for who I could be when I grew up. Um, and so I guess I, guess I picked Ursula. 
Right. <laughs> uh, oh thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Mwah. Thank you. Jane? Thank what? You. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't make me do it. Um, that was phenomenal, Lindy. Thank you. Oh my gosh, You're I'm still phenomenal. laughing. Oh my God. Um, uh, okay. Uh, this is going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I read that utterly absurd. Um, there, I have the word steroidal disgusting stuck thing. in my head. Um, well, you did mention poop. I did. So I, the beginning of my memoir, which is coming out in May, starts with poop. So I feel like this is perfect. This is yeah, poop, poop, perfect. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'll just read from the very beginning of Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. Um, and uh, it starts with uh, a section called Dragon Fruit. And then I think I'll read just the very opening of the title chapter. Um, but I don't know if any of you have had dragon fruit or um, I hear like a s like a yes, like kind of like a, a sizzle sound. Um, thank you for that. Um, and uh, in addition to it being very delicious, it also makes you poop because there's tons of seeds in it. Um, so maybe you didn't think this is where I was gonna go <laughs> when I was opening this. Okay, it's called Dragon Fruit. In the murky broth of yet another heartache, my mother cuts me slices of dragon fruit. I'm home in Jersey and slumped at the kitchen table. My hair is dip dyed in snot, tears, and hot mascara. She hands me a slice the white interior flecked with black seeds like suspended ants. The slice dangles on her knife, the glinty steel close to my mouth. I eat it off the knife. I've always eaten fruit this way, right off the sparks of my mother's blade. I take it into my throat, still heaving from too much survival mode. The taste is mild despite the fluorescent hot pink flame. The seeds punctuate something I know must come. It slides down my throat like a sweet summer slug. Jane, you have to be strong. I need you to eat more, she tells me, cutting another slice. So I tell her I'm so tired of being strong. Fuck strength, fuck resilience, fuck lessons to learn, fuck trying and trying and trying. I tell her I don't want to be strong. I can't be strong anymore, even if I wanted to be. I want to be weak. I want to fall completely apart. I want all the atoms in my body to crumble, scree of the self. I want to lie down on this cold kitchen table forever. I want to be a sloth who hasn't shit in a week, week. Cracked ice, dish soap bubbles, mild hot sauce, rabbit paralyzed by fear, my breath leaking from me like an ellipses weak. I expect her to disagree, to demand strength, to tell me I have no choice. Does she have a choice staring at the gaping pits my father left behind? This time though, she doesn't fight me, so be weak, she says, like a threat. Sticky fruit juice encircles her jade bracelet and fruit flies rouse around us, dizzy stars. But you have to eat more dragon fruit and clear your system. She wants me to shit it out. And this time she hands me the knife. Um, that's how it opens, <laughs> with poop. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna read the very beginning of Meet Me Tonight in Atlantic City. Um, I don't know if there's any people from Jersey here. Um, I have like deep roots in Jersey and Seattle. <laughs> These are like my two, two homes of sorts. Um, yeah, yeah, woo. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, if any, yeah, you may know that the, the title is a shout out to Bruce Springsteen song, um, Love the Boss. Um, long story short, uh, my father is a gambler um, and I grew up in a Chinese American restaurant and he gambled the restaurant away. So this is the very beginning of that particular chapter. Meet me tonight in Atlantic City. Let's begin here on the ground or rather on the slabs of wood above the ground. On July 5th, 1854, Camden, New Jersey welcomed the first tourist train. Tourists came to stick their toes in the Atlantic Ocean, steel blue, the color of whales they'll never see. They came to lean against each other in the high dunes and make promises they couldn't keep. They let the wind lift those promises up, 
caught in the chandeliers of expensive hotels or the beaks of passing seagulls. The women who came held frilled umbrellas, jellyfish along the shore. And when they returned to their jobs and errands and thumb-sucking babies, they carried sand with them, making a train car a beach in and of itself, glitter of the sea. This is how the boardwalk came to be, a frustrated railroad conductor and simply too much sand for his own sleeping sanity. On June 16, 1870, boards were erected 10 feet wide and 12 feet long. Just to be clear, this is not our story, not yet. Our story moves across that steel blue fantasy onto another continent toward a place where there's no such thing as vacation. My ancestors will stare at that word vacation as if it were a cloud that could disappear at any point. On this continent, there are herds of oxen and lily pads the size of promises that can't be made. And as a small child, I dreamt of this story, of an ox and my mother riding its back, the hair on its hide so coarse it makes your throat hurt. Our story, our history, is a different Atlantic City. It's 1988, and my mother is still dreaming in toy Siamese. Not a single word of English worms her way to her open mouth sleep world. My little brother, Stephen, had just been born howling like a wolf who knew he was a boy. Four years earlier, when the nurses placed me in my mother's arms, I stared at her, and she held me up to the fluorescent hospital light and declared, I'm afraid. She knows too much. True story, I mean, it's all a true story. Um, by 1988, my father had been holding illegal mahjong gambling circles for five years in the basement. Cigarette smoke escapes like doves from underneath the floorboards. And the shuffling, the shuffling of mahjong tiles of porcelain earthquake. I learned later that some of those tiles used to be made out of bone or bamboo and they're now bakelite plastic. My father always invited the same people to play with him, the chicken bone man, city uncle, balding uncle. His friends always played with toothpicks dangling out of their mouths, moving the sticks from side to side in concentration. And my brother and I named them the toothpick gang. Just to be clear again, our story is not about small enterprises. Our story goes beyond the small batons of $20 bills passed around the mahjong table, beyond the table's green felt stained with cheap Tao and sky-high piles of gnawed bones from the chicken bone man's self-evident pastime. Our story is Atlantic City. We're talking Taj Mahal, Caesar's Palace, Bali, casinos depicting worlds my father simply couldn't fathom. At Caesar's Palace, there were towering white columns so extravagant they held up nothing at all. There were white statues of horses braying, a ceiling painted like the sky with white clouds, and the busts of white people we assumed were famous, but really were just white. Uh, my parents didn't even know where Rome was on a map or that Rome existed, but Caesar's palace was gleaming in its whiteness, and who can say no to the patina of wealth? This is how we arrived on a Chinese tourist bus where you have to fan yourself with your $10 gambling voucher and put your cigarette out in a Dixie cup. Or if you hit it big like we once did, you can arrive in the dolphin colored leather of your BMW before you inevitably crash it into the Garden Parkway median. No air conditioning and the windows down to save on gas mileage, of course. We arrived over a century later on a boardwalk full of non-white faces, shoulder pads, pinstripe suits, and an amalgamation of languages punctuated in the salty ear air. The poor, the working class, the hopeful in red tag sequin dresses from Marshalls. Here we are, yes, here with self-serve wine and crab legs at the palace buffet, all of which we marveled at, but we never touched. Mm. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Lindy. Um, so this is a craft conference in part. These are all writers in this room. And so I want to start by asking some questions about the craft of writing um, your work. And I was curious about the interplay between essays and memoir for you both. And do you think of memoir and essays as different genres? And is your process different for essays versus memoir? Jane, I was wondering if you could start. I know that some of your book ap appeared first as essays. How much shaping did you have to do to form those essays into the memoir? And how did you think about the interplay between those two genres? Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, I'm a poet. <laughs> um, and I would say, if anything, I feel like all of these are like basic little, po little poems, too. So I'm not even sure what a 
what the hell is an essay? What the hell is a memoir? What's, what's a poem? Um, but I think that for me, um, when I, uh, you know, when this book was coming out into the world, I wrote this as singular essays. Um, and for me, writing um, a memoir felt incredibly daunting. I'd be curious to hear Lenny you talk about that too, because um, I knew I needed to find some sort of through line um, or something to kind of like braid it together. Um, and for me, writing singular essays was like a place where I could kind of um, live in this little like cave of an essay where I didn't have to think about why these were connected in any way. Um, but uh, in this memoir, when I was writing it, um, they, they, Tin House basically uh, uh, kind of decided to go with it only if it was gonna be a memoir. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess I'll try to write one. And I, I worked on this like idea of this through line for so long. And I decided to, I think maybe um, do something kind of fun, which is like uh, my through line ended up being a character I made up, which I feel like in nonfiction, like I guess there's fiction in here too. Mm -hmm. um, so the through line for me is um, there's my real mom in this memoir and then there's my mom that lives in the internet um, called wongmom.com um, and she's, I hope you find it funny, thank you, because like, it's like ridiculous. She literally lives in old school, um, kind of like angel fire sites. Like she's, she's actually, and in the book, the design, the design team was awesome, but it's actually um, like a, a black border, like a URL kind of, just like a play off of it. Um, and she lives in the internet um, and like gives you advice um, uh, through like kind of like a mom bot. Um, so that's what happened to me, <laughs> and I actually bought the domain, um, and my friend uh, is going to make wongmom.com real. So I think it's Amazing. so fun. I guess, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that I was forced to like push myself to make a through line, to make this a memoir, and it led me to the most ridiculous character, which is like my mom to like the hundredth degree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like for instance, when we had like a heat wave in Seattle recently. In the book, I feed her, I feed wongmom.com ice cubes into like into the computer and it <laughs> melts and, and cools her down, like stuff like that. So that's what happened to me. <laughs> Lindy, how about for you? What, I mean, you've written both a memoir and a book of essays. How was your process different for those books? Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a, a great tough question. Uh, it's, I feel like, um, I have insecurity, like essay sounds so fancy and like sometimes when I'm feeling insecure, I'll call myself an essayist to make myself sound fancier. <laughs> you know, like, cause I feel like what I really do is memoir, um, which is like, like shrill is just like a, like a, like screamingly vulnerable. Mm. And that's the through line. Like I, I don't, uh, I don't think I, it, there are ways in which, um, and, I, and I, I don't say this to be self-deprecating, but there are ways in which, like, Shrill was my first book, and it's kind of unsophisticated in this way, where it doesn't have, like, an elegant through line. It's like, I wrote down all my feelings. It, in a, it's, uh, my writing's really voicey. It's all, obviously, <laughs> ridiculous thing I just read to you. Um, and, like, I never quite know what, if it counts as an essay or not. You know, like if I wrote, if I wrote a thousand words about my period, <laughs> like does that count as an essay? <laughs> um, but then, yeah, I did write a book that I think is essays. The Witches Are Coming is discrete. Um, each chapter is about sort of a different political pop cultural thing. So there's that side of my writing too. Um, and I, yeah, I guess I don't, I have no idea what the line is and I don't know how to answer this, but um, I guess I just try to, there, I feel like there's a pressure with an, okay, no, I do know the answer for me. When I'm writing memoir, I don't feel the need to tie everything up in, with like a beautiful structure and a bow mm -hmm. and a thesis and a conclusion. Mm -hmm. It can be a lot more of a smear, like it can just be very visceral. And definitely when I write about pop culture or I write about politics, um, I, I, I try to make it cleaner, mm -hmm. you know, um, and punchier. And I try to, um, you know, uh, like, okay, like for instance, not to keep plugging myself, but the, I, I wrote a thing in The Guardian that came out today where the goal for me was very clear, which was to make Darren Aronofsky feel 
so guilty that he died. <laughs> um, so it, like, it has, I guess an essay to me has a purpose mm. beyond, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He has to live so that he can feel the guilt for hurting me for the rest of his life. Um, but uh, yeah, like an essay has a, has a purpose, whereas a memoir can just be more, um, but yeah, I already said it. I don't need to restate it. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about how, you know, Lindy, I was thinking about the differences and similarities between both of your works and how Lindy, I feel like your essays and memoir are sort of like at the intersection of journalism and, you know, sometimes closer and sometimes farther off. And Jane, that you're writing memoir at the intersection of poetry. And I was, you know, thinking about how, like how argument driven is a thing, right? Like, does it have a, like a purpose, like you just said, but I would also argue, you know, the other side of things is that often that poems have arguments too in them. And do you feel, I'm curious, Jane and Lindy, you know, how much you sort of your core genre, the genre you started with, you know, poetry or journalism, like how much has that affected your evolution into, into memoir? Would you start, Jane? Oh my God. Um, I think what would happen to me oftentimes when I would like read um, poems out loud was that I'd always tell this like ridiculous story right before I read the poem and people were like, wait, you went to illegal like dentists growing up, but you just like randomly mentioned that before you read this poem that had nothing really, in my mind, it didn't have anything to do with it. It was related, but I think it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, like I think there's more here and it needs more space. I mean, poems are, even if you love long poems, like they are pretty short compared, like this is like, like heavy, you know, <laughs> like look at this thing. Um, and it's gonna come, it's gonna be hard cover. So it can like, it can really like squish something. Um, <laughs> sorry, I mean, I was gonna be more specific. It can kill a cockroach. Um, I grew up in a restaurant. Um, look, all restaurants have cockroaches, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the reality. Um, they're so hard, I love them, they're, they're survivors too. Um, but this took so like much time to write in terms of just like the physical number of words here. I think for poems, like I feel like I'm always like thinking about a poem as like a bouillon cube. Like, you know, I've really always tried to get it as like packed and as like, like full of synesthesia and just full of like intensity. Whereas this book, actually when you use that word smear, did you use smear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was like, it was kind of my experience. Like I felt this was a little messier, a little more like like spillage. Uh, it felt a little bit more like a sludge. And I really appreciated the space and time for like, you know, that to happen in, in nonfiction. And I think also there's a lot of research in here. Um, this has a very long bibliography. Um, and I'm even thinking about kind of like the difficulty of researching a lot of my family's history that's oftentimes not recorded. Like there's a chapter in here called Ghost Archive and like what does it mean that like, you know, like poor poor Chinese immigrants, you know, didn't necessarily, like they don't, ha I don't have anywhere to go find them in the archive, right? And what does it mean to kind of, um, you know, fact check also a story that my grandfather said, you know, it's like, com it was complicated, I think. Whereas I think in, a, in poetry, there was a lot more freedom, I think, to kind of, uh, just be okay with the fact that it was um, made up. Whereas I feel like memoir or nonfiction, there was a, a bit more pressure, obviously, in terms of like making sure this was all adding up uh, factually. So um, in poetry, we, you know, there's not like a thing really to fact check, but that was a big experience, like difference for me. And I felt almost like a little baby being like, wait, you have to do what? Like I didn't know anything, you know, I just assumed that I was just going to just like be a, a poet floating off into the wind as I always do, you know, like a, I don't know. Someone recently asked me, is like, what's the difference of like writing, what's the difference like in terms of your, in, in terms of your embodied experience of like writing a poem versus writing nonfiction or prose? And I feel like in uh, kind of like as a, as a poet, I feel like I'm just kind of like hopping on to, onto a pigeon and taking like a joy ride down like the city streets, like eating <laughs> snacks. Whereas I feel like in prose, I, I feel like there is a bit more, like, I don't know, like purpose. Like maybe that's a rat instead. I don't know, um, tunneling through 
um, the underground. But uh, I don't know what, I, okay, I started doing poety things just now uh, in terms of the pigeons and the rats, so I'm just gonna stop myself because I actually can go on weird poetry tangents. So <laughs> I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. I have no idea what the question was. No, that was, that was great, that was great. <laughs> Lindy, how do, you know, how do you feel about, like you started off in a more journalistic realm, you know, writing sort of op-eds or pieces with a sort of journalistic impulse, like how did that influence or how have you moved away or, or towards that? that work? Yeah, I feel like I move back towards and away all the time. Um, I started in arts criticism. Um, I hesitate to call myself a journalist because I am allergic to interviewing people and not having an opinion. So, which are kind of the two most important parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I started as a critic. Like, I was a theater critic, and then I was mm -hmm. a film critic, and then I became a culture critic. I, then I started writing for feminist, like for Jezebel, for online media, when that was sort of just being born. Um, and I don't know, especially, and that's where I learned to write. I learned to write, unfortunately, on the job in front of people, mm. <laughs> which is like, scary in retrospect, because um, I didn't, y you know, it's all out there online. Please don't go read my early work. Um, but there's this way when you're writing criticism that the author, me, is, the critic is present, but also invisible. And I always felt this tension of wanting people to understand where my perspective was coming from to really understand what I was saying and why I was saying it. I, I was never interested in having kind of a um, authoritative, authorial voice. Um, I wanted to write as me, and especially when I moved to Jezebel and online media was still kind of the Wild West, I got to start writing more like personal, I guess you'd call them essays. I, I got to start writing, because um, at that time, there was this whole economy of like women's confessional writing where you'd be like, you know, women would like 19 year olds would get paid $200 to be like, I gave 80 guys a blowjob or what, like all this stuff where you're like, oh my God, that's so, no one should have done that. <laughs> Why did we, and then these, anyway, uh, it always felt a little bit exploitative to me, um, but, sorry, that was a horrible tangent, but um, I feel like it led me to this place where thinking about the last question, like when I write memoir, it's like me desperately trying to introduce myself or, you know, I, 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 the goal is for the reader to know me um, and see me and it makes it so much richer to do the other kind of work mm -hmm. for me where then I can go write a piece of criticism and I feel like the reader has the whole picture. And maybe that's bad, I'm not sure. I feel like that's not actually how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to have some sort of innate authority, but I, that doesn't interest me, I guess. Um, I've always relied on my voice uh, being very, very defined and loud. And I feel like that's where my success has come from because it made me a, um, not a commodity that was not replicable, and so I've just always chased that. Um, but I, I also don't remember what the question was. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel really lucky that I, I've gotten to do. Um, I've just I've gotten to spend so many years doing exactly the kind of writing that feels fun to me, mm -hmm. which is like a combination of being a complete goofball, idiot writing filthy things about the Lou from <laughs> Robin Hood um, and also, you know, writing really, really personal, vulnerable things that I think are genuinely important. Um, you know, like that chapter that I read is ridiculous and the core of it is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to this day, it's still, it's something that still affects me all the time despite having processed it in print for eight years uh, or more. So yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm somewhere else, but that's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> so y you both mentioned vulnerability and we you know, of course, when you're writing true-ish things, there's this tension between vulnerability and risk between exposure and privacy. Um, and you know, Lindy, you sort of you know, referenced like sort of doing that live in front of a lot of people as you were learning how to do that. 
how do you both manage this line for yourself now and like what have you learned along the way about like how much to expose and how much to keep for yourself? Leah, Leah, Leah you why don't you start? start? Um, it's so tough and it's, it's all kind of a um, illusion because I think that people think of me as a very confessional, like, you know, oversharing kind of a writer, but I'm actually very controlled and very private, and there's a lot of stuff that I don't write about at all. Like, I don't write, I mean, I, no one's ever noticed this, but like, I don't write about sex at all. Like, I'm actually like a weird, like a weird prude who's like scared to write sex words, um, unless it's like a <laughs> full joke. Um, Cause like, I'm Norwegian and I don't know, we don't, we're, we're repressed. Um, and I, you know, there are, you have to, um, especially to do the kind of writing that I do and probably to do memoir in general. I'm sure this is the same for everyone. Well, I shouldn't say that, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was similar for people who do this kind of writing. You have to have the firmest boundaries around what you do and don't share because otherwise, especially in the age of the internet, like it's not like I get to be like J.D. Salinger or whatever and go like hide in my hole and never talk to anyone. I am like constantly bleeding into the internet where people are like taking pieces of me all the time. And then I'm writing these really personal things and putting them into this book and selling them and going and talking to people and people come up to me on the street and they cry and they tell me about their abortion. Like you have to like, you have to be so clear and so firm about what you keep for yourself and for your family. Um, and that is one thing that I'm good at is like kind of effortlessly because it's a survival mechanism. Like I have to, like I know what's mine and it is not yours. And maybe I, people don't know that that barrier is there, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point where there's some of that stuff, like I'm working on a new book now that I'm trying to break some of that down and like take some things out a little bit more and be a little bit more honest than I ever have been. Um, Cause I feel like uh, and maybe just sort of reorient what I keep in and what I let out. Um, but yeah, it's a process for me. Jane? I'm like learning a lot from you, Lindsay. <laughs> I'm just like squirrel this away, boundaries. Um, I am not so good at that sometimes. Um, I really appreciate what you're just shared, especially in thinking about kind of like, you know, what is, uh, what other people may think is vulnerable, right? In terms of like what you shared, but actually what actually is vulnerable um, in terms of your own personal life and like what you're willing and not willing to kind of give to people. And I think for me, um, you know, my, my second book of poems, How to Not Be, How to not be Afraid of Everything, um, could be arguably vulnerable, right? Because it talks a lot about my family's history of um, hunger and starvation during the Great Leap Forward and me growing up uh, in a restaurant, like surrounded by gluttony. And for some, I mean, it is vulnerable. It is, you know, a censored topic, you know, in China, it's very vulnerable. Um, and, you know, I mean, like I can't not write about food and, you know, my family's history in this memoir. But like the true, like what I was really afraid to write about in this, this book, which I ultimately did, which I'm terrified. People keep asking or saying to me, like, I'm so excited for your memoir. And I just, I cringe and fall into like a curtain and just like disappear. Um, you know, um, I was going to say like, like Gak, if anyone remembers Gak, but that's not at all the right metaphor because it doesn't disappear. It stays with you. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, tangent um, is that uh, it's my shitty white ex-boyfriends. Um, that is where I'm vulnerable. Yes to the <laughs> shitty white <laughs> ex-boyfriends. Um, I was absolutely terrified of like writing about um, a lot of internalized racism and a lot of, you know, the fact that I, 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 I wore like, I used whitening products, like, you know, like moisturizer when I was like in high school and that was literally disappearing. Like my skin was like translucent, it was terrifying. And that was horrifying to admit. There's one essay in here, or chapter, whatever you want to call it, um, where my mom put me in um, New Jersey beauty pageants growing up. Like, it's a long story, but I did not win, of course. <laughs> it's always like the blonde, you know, like girl that wins. But um, in that particular chapter essay, I mean, I really talk a lot about like whiteness, literally like, whiteness in terms of like 
um, that wearing these kind of like white whitening products and kind of trying to whiten my skin um, call it whatever you want like now you can hide it under like milk skin or glass skin but it's 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 whitening products to some degree um, but then I had to address my white boyfriends and what is the obsession the obsession and I'm putting that in all caps underlined like bright neon lights with white men and Asian women and that was the most terrifying thing to admit was that you know like seven out of my like nine serious boyfriends um, at that time I wrote that essay um, were white right and like the and I hope it's funny that's the other thing too I mean I learned from writers like like Lindsay in terms of like the tone is so important here like I can't that's it's it's horrible my, my ex-boyfriends but also I hope it's funny because they're all kind of like the same um, they're always trying to make me watch this like war documentary and like trying to get me to go hiking. I don't want to go, okay? Like, I, and they're just like, oh, I brought you like three sandwiches, like, you know, and a cookie. And I'm just like, fine, like, I'll just, you know, and then I'll take the, they always want to take this picture of me so I look picture perfect. Like, I was, obs they were obsessed with how they wanted me to be. They're, they're like, I don't know what to call it. You can, you know, go way back. I'm, I also am a professor of Asian American studies, and so I've been thinking about the idea of like the China doll, all of that. Um, there's a great book called or Ornamentalism um, that kind of speaks a lot about very, very, um, you know, gendered, you know, like Asian Americanness in terms of what um, Asian American women's bodies were seen as quite literally um, porcelain, right? Um, like to be a vase, to be an object of desire and that it's still to this day like I, I cringe every single time thinking about that internalized racism and what it means that I desired that like I desired white men desiring me um, and so that was the hardest thing to write about in this book and um, you know in many ways like you can say that my memoir is like oh it's about growing up in Jersey and um, you know it's an immigrant baby narrative and she grew up in a restaurant there are a lot of shitty ex-boyfriends in here, and I did not <laughs> want to take them out. Like, it's part of it, and it's the most vulnerable part of this book um, to the current day, you know? Right? Like, I, I ended, I, I was engaged, you know, a year ago. I am not currently engaged. Um, thank you. Congrats <laughs> to me. Um, and I think that I, I needed, I was so vulnerable, and I decided to write up to the minute of this book, the instant, the day I handed in my first draft, it was my life right now. And that probably was the most terrifying thing. But I did it, because you know what? I don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask a few questions about your writing community, or the community that supports you and has supported you through your writing process. Um, do you have first readers for your work, or, or who are your readers? And Lindy, maybe you could start. Do you have readers for your work? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have any kind of a formal system. And I know that other writers do, and that's probably the right way to do it. I am such a procrastinator that I truly am a like 4 a.m. on the deadline day when it's due at 4.01 sending the manuscript directly to my editor while crying. But um, the, also, as I'm working, if I will, I do send passages, especially most, um, you know, uh, most frequently to my husband, um, because we're, we've been together forever and we're creative collaborators too, and he just really understands me and, um, Especially, you know, like, because I write memoir, like, he knows who I am, so it's, it's helpful. I can be like, is this right? <laughs> um, and then I have um, a couple of other authors who I'm really close with that I send stuff to. I send stuff to Samantha Irby, um, who is, you know, the, the writer I would love to be. Um, and my friend Angela Garbez, who may or may not be here. She might be still eating lunch. But um, uh, I send Angela stuff because she's... Um, just a, a brilliant writer and a brilliant like feeler um, and um, I don't know I love my agent Gary I send <laughs> Gary stuff um, uh, couldn't do it without Gary but yeah I mean I mostly I and, and this is probably 
um, like I said, bad. I, uh, I obsessively read everything four billion times and I churn it myself alone over and over and over and over before I send anything because I, um, you know, like most of my writing process, it's like I'll write a paragraph and then I'll write one more line and then I'll start the paragraph over and I'll rewrite and then I'll write another line and then I start. So um, mostly my, my pre-reader is myself, which is probably, um, you know, I, I should be more open to um, input, but I, I, I'm, I don't know why. I don't know. I'm a narcissist, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, Angela, Sam, Ahame Filet, Gary. Got it. In case you guys needed some <laughs> recommendations. Need some tips, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jane, how about, how about you? Who are your, do you have readers? Oh, yeah. For I this have, work? I have, like, so many readers. They're probably bored of me by now. I almost am kind of, like, it's, I'm probably annoying, you know, in terms of, hey, you want to check this out? Um, but, yeah, they're kind of just my besties, you know? Michelle, shout out to Michelle Penulosa always. Um, she's always usually my first reader. Uh, for this particular uh, memoir, um, I did have first readers who I told just like, just be honest with me, you know, just like tell me this is trash, uh, you know, or too poety. That was my actually biggest worry was like, oh my God, it's going to be so poety. Um, guess what? It is uh, <laughs> because I'm a poet, um, but uh, that's fine, I guess. Um, but Michelle Penulosa was one of the first readers. Brenda Miller, who's a fantastic nonfiction writer. Tessa Holes, who has a graphic memoir. Um, coming out, um, and uh, my friend Quentin Baker, phenomenal poet. By the way, Quentin was the har he was the one that I was the most afraid of sending to because he's he can be let's just say uh, we're we're the ones in the corner side eyeing like things you know like kind of like hmm. And so when he actually sent me his uh, feedback, he actually wrote at the very top. Um, he has a book coming out at Haymarket, FYI. Um, and it said, you made me want to write, and I haven't written in like two years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, for real? I was, I was going to cry. I was like, it was really powerful. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been really grateful. I feel like I have a, a lovely group of like communities, uh, like of, of writers and friends. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I'm obsessed with my mom, maybe to a, a definitely stalkerish degree. Um, <laughs> and uh, she... She does not, um, due to the language barrier, um, doesn't read my, my work really. She, she, her her uh, spoken English is fantastic and I have like terrible uh, Toysonese Cantonese so we don't ever talk in like Toysonese but um, she is a USPS uh, you know, worker, like uh, postal clerk at night. She works night shift. She's worked night shift for like 25 years. And again, my mom is such a ham. Like she's super, super fluent but she doesn't read read. And so what happens actually is that she'll oftentimes take my book or like things I've written and uh, ask her coworkers at the post office night shift to read it to her and they'll talk about it. And she'll be like, oh, I like that. Or like, I don't know, not, not that one. It's not, it doesn't make sense. And so my mom is actually my most hilarious critic because she's just like, um, pretty real about it, but um, she she ultimately, I feel like, is my, my closest reader, even though she doesn't necessarily read my work, but in many ways she does, and I just love that she takes it in her work bag along with her, like, ginger chews and um, bandages for, like, paper cuts, because, you know, post office, I mean, you're sorting mail all day, mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like, certainly, and I also am similar, I feel like I, I, re I actually started this doing this thing, and I don't know if you, you do it too, but I will record myself reading a, a passage, um, and then I will do something mundane, like chop up vegetables, um, and put myself on like a podcast, pretend I'm listening to a podcast, but it's me, and I'll hear when something's off. Like I'll hear, I'll want to revise due to, oh, that sentence was so like, oh, you know, like, or something was missing there. And so, but that, I record, I like to record myself. I think maybe my poetry background it's like everything is very like uh, metered and having, I couldn't do that for 300 pages continually, but there is the meter in here. I couldn't help it because I have to translate basically a line to a sentence. Um, but yeah, hmm. it's hard. Revision's hard. Are you doing the audiobook for your book? Oh, to be continued. Yeah, 
Yes. Okay. We are in the midst of it right a now, and I want to say the definitive yes. Oh, I can't. But yet. we don't know. Okay. Okay. Lindy, I was listening to um, your book um, was on audio. Should actually, and you know, thinking about you reading it too, and I'm so curious. You know, when you are, you know, reading audio book, it's sometime after you've actually written the book. Do you have a temptation to ever line edit or revise when you're reading? I mean, and yeah, how do and you you're resist? Not you're not allowed to. to do it, right? You're yeah. not allowed to. It's devastating. Yeah. You're <laughs> like, oh, I so can see the better word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially because, like, I know I said that I, you know, read it. I write very carefully and I revise constantly. Also, there's big chunks that I, like I said, do at 4 a.m. and just send, and then they end up in there sometimes and I'm like ah well I get to the audiobook and I'm like what is this <laughs> I mean and of course like that's just my insecurity talking because they've been through an editor and a copy editor and a proofreader and a whatever it's fine but like there are these moments where there are whole packages pa passages where I'm like I don't remember this at all and I hate it <laughs> um, but you, you're, it's torture you have to just read it yeah. exactly as it is on the page yeah. but it's fine it's yeah. good yeah. it's 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 a good I mean, honestly, it's a great exercise in letting go because that's one of the scary things about revisions is you could revise forever. And at a certain point, you have to call it and you have to trust yourself and you have to trust your editor and be like, I, this is fine. I am just being hypercritical. Um, and I do read, I read all my stuff out loud before I send it to, cause for that exact reason. So that's, that helps. Um, cause I, I hate getting into the, um, you know, this, the recording booth and realizing that I've written something that cannot be said out loud. <laughs> um, and I, sometimes I do anyway because I like to do like bizarre, complicated, like origami punctuation where it's like brackets inside of parentheses with a footnote. And, and then, so sometimes I really write myself into a, into a shithole, um, but it's fine, it's fun, it's worth it. Um, that's the fun of getting to write you know, in print, is you can play with the form. Um, but yeah, uh, I hate that I can't yeah. change it. And I, you, can't, you don't get to laugh at your own jokes either. I'm always like, <laughs> wouldn't it be charming if this audiobook had me laughing at my own jokes? But they say no, no. they say no. <laughs> I can hear when you smile though. You know, you, oh, good. you, can, hear, you can hear the smile, I like that. Um, okay, I wanna know, what are your favorite writing snacks and drinks, what do you have when you're banging it out at four in the morning, like, or at three in the afternoon. I wanna hear from you both, like, what are, need to have snacks and drinks? Lindy. I mean, it changes with every book. Um, each book has its own, like, I feel like on Shrill, I was like, eating a lot of runts. <laughs> Why? Because they like last a long time, they're like hard and weird. Yes. <laughs> and they're just sort of like an activity, like you have to like really munch them like a little squirrel. <laughs> and they're cute and they're satisfying. They make a satisfying noise when you pour them in because uh -huh. their heart is rocks. I don't know, I don't, anything but banana. The bananas get thrown away. Um, and then I drink a lot of Coke Zero. Um, I'm one of those people. Like I, apparently there's a rivalry between the Coke Zero people and the Diet Coke people. Um, I, I feel, I don't know. I, I feel like I love everyone and I would like us to join together. Um, a lot of Coke Zero. I like to take, I like to, if I have a plastic bottle of Coke Zero, um, I like to turn it when it's really late, like 4, 4.30 a.m., I turn it upside down and I stick it in my cleavage and then I rest my chin on it. <laughs> <laughs> Mortifying. Um, but I truly do that for hours. That's amazing. And um, uh, you, now did your snacks evolve? You said for shrill it was yeah, runs, you, but like, um, what happened next? Uh, sweet tarts. Uh, when I was writing The Witches Are Coming, I, I discovered that they make um, dill pickle flavored um, sunflower seeds. Mm. So there's sunflower seeds with pickle powder on them. So I ate like 40 pounds of those. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it's an activity because you have to like, I right. like having like, you know, it's like when it's you are looking at your phone while you're watching TV. It's like I need like something to, um, and then uh, what am I eating while I write this book? Mm, I don't know. Just like, I think I'm mostly just in a coffee 
and just like drinking 20 cups of coffee a day, which is um, gross. <laughs> okay, well, wh when you identify the snack of this book, let us know. I know. I, yeah. Let me think about it yeah. while um, Jane talks, okay. and maybe I'll remember. Thank you. Now I feel like I should give you some snacks or something like that. Yeah. Seaweed? Oh, yeah. Okay, when I, I was on a residency once in the woods, and it, it was only wholesome snacks, and I discovered that if you take like a nori and you wrap it around a piece of cheese, it sort of tastes like a Cheeto. It's like so <laughs> satisfying, it's so good. So that was one of my book snacks for sure. Anyway. Okay, you know, I have not had this seaweed cheese combo, but it actually reminded me, I don't know where, what residency you went to, but I went to Hedgebrook. It was a Hedgebrook. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they, you know, I had a feeling because like I was thinking to myself, there's a snack area at Hedgebrook, like an actual room. Like I say this with like the deep, I'm like, I don't know who I'm looking at in terms of in the <laughs> far distance, it's the snack corner I'm looking at. And they had seaweed, um, which is the most, for me, that's like the ideal snack of, of a kind of writing time because it's like so salty, it's so salty, but it's crunchy and it gets all over you. And there's something about, I actually need to be pretty messy. <laughs> like my snacks, I want to kind of have the dust when I write. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why, but it just pleases me to no end. And actually, uh, I was going through the seaweed so fast, actually at Hedgebrook, that um, they had to go, I think they get it from Costco. Uh, and they had to go, go to these trips to Costco for, for me, mostly. But here's the other thing. I'm, I am lactose intolerant, I guess. I say this because like, uh, I don't want this to be true of my life. And so I love cheese. Like I'm a kind of, it's like, you know how it is. Like if you don't have cheese, you kind of start to like feel really bad. Um, and uh, I wrote, because I'm, I can't do heavy cream and I, you write out a form. This is the things, your dietary restrictions. And I wrote that I was lactose intolerant. I'll never do that again. Because it um, <laughs> turns out that that means no cheese. Um, but I just meant no heavy cream. I can't have ice cream, I can't have bisques or whatever. I can't have milk, whatever. But cheese, I can have. I've worked on this my whole life. Um, and uh, some, for some reason, all the other residents at this residency were lactose intolerant. In other words, there was no cheese for like, what, three, four weeks? And I did a bad thing. Um, the chef has their own personal um, fridge. And one of the rules, they say early on, like, don't touch, this is my food. And I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then I was starting to get the, the cheese fear. Like, you know, I was like <laughs> so freaking out because you're kind of stuck there for, you know, in this beautiful place. But you're like, I was like, I need a cheese uh, to write. But really, I mean, that's my number one thing I have to have. If I can make the most beautiful charcuterie board of just cheese, really, it's just cheese. Um, but like, I love fruit too. It's like, if those could be my things. Um, and I went and I actually, I did, I did. I took it out at midnight, um, uh, at, like, like a mouse, <laughs> quite literally. And I squirreled it away and I ate it all. And then I came back, I, I, didn't, I didn't lie, I didn't lie, you know, it wasn't like, you know. But I remember I, I, the, she asked everyone out loud, like, you know, like, hey, someone <laughs> took this cheese. <laughs> Y'all are lactose intolerant. <laughs> you know, do you know what happened? Like, did, you know, and I was just sitting there, just kind of like with the most guilty look on my face. And I was like, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, and I was like, fine, it was me, it was me. I like, I'm sorry, I just really need cheese. Like, I really need cheese to write. And she was like, what? And so she actually <laughs> went out. She's so nice, so nice. And went out that very, very instant, like I think within the hour and went to a beautiful farmer, like farmer's market or somewhere where local and got me like, I think six cheeses, all different kinds, three, like you name it. And I had this cheese, like it arrived and I should have mixed it with the seaweed and I didn't even think about that because these are my two things that were like my Hedgebrook time. So uh, thank you for that uh, future recipe. <laughs> Um, <laughs> last, last thing I'll say about food, because I have lots of other snacks, it's mostly cheese space, so like cheese, anything that has cheese on it, that's what I want to eat when I write. Um, but I one time did a, a virtual reading, um, a poetry reading, and it was a hot pot poetry reading. And we had on screen, we had hot pot, like as we were reading poems, and everyone on screen 
had hot pot. It was the most beautiful thing I've experienced on a Zoom, in Zoom life. It's just like everybody was having hot pot while listening to poetry. And if I could somehow like ladle and type at the same time, <laughs> it would be the best. Like hot pot is like my happy place. Like that's like, that's like never ending. It doesn't end. And with you, if you think it's over, it's not because you shouldn't throw away that soup at the end. You can still save it for the next day and like re-hot pot. And I just, I don't even do it. I just leave it on my counter and just the next day, mm. just crank it up. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. Amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about where and how you write. And I'm curious if the pandemic changed sort of your patterns and habits of writing. You know, like what is your setup? Do you write out in the world? Do you write at home? Do you have favorite writing haunts in the Seattle area? Um, Lindy, why don't you start? Well, um, I wrote every book so far uh, on my living room couch, like hunched over like a monster um, with the Coke Zero bottle. Um, because I just never had a, a room, I never had an office that worked for me or, you know, we had two kids and, they each wanted their own room and then there was no, I don't know. So I just did a combination of like horrible, I mean, this is probably why I can't sit up straight um, to this day. Um, so for years and years, I just worked in the living room on the couch. And then, um, uh, or I would go to the coffee shop. I mean, if you want, I shouldn't say this, but if you do want to come visit me while I'm working, I am constantly at the Cafe Vita in Seward Park. Uh, but now we have moved to a new house that has a tiny house in the backyard and I have my own little castle with my, I have like all my little things and I have like my little candles and I have a big office chair that was like made by a mattress company. Like it is incredible. It is so huge and so comfortable. And um, also, unfortunately, my little office house has a bed in it, so sometimes I have to fall asleep. Um, and uh, I, it's like so life-changing, like mm -hmm. to the point where I just, I just went on another residency and it was amazing, but the whole time I was like, wish I had my chair. Like I was just like, I don't know if I could do this without my chair, I'm like, my chair. <laughs> um, so I'm really attached to my chair. And, um, and honestly, like it has, facilitated not to be melodramatic, but I feel like I'm turning into a different kind of writer finally in my 40s where I am capable of sitting down and treating writing like a physical task where it's like I go to my little office, I'm excited to go there in the morning and then I open my computer and I turn off the Wi-Fi and I, and I just make my hands physically type. Um, rather than what I used to do, which was like sit in chaos with like my dog and my husband and my kids running around and everyone's talking to me. And then I wait until inspiration strikes, which is never. And then it's again, 4 a.m. And I have to wait until everyone has gone to bed and then I frantically, you know, like I've, I've been able to become this, at least sometimes become this person that I always dreamed of being who like actually treats her job like a job. <laughs> and uh, it's so, it's been really incredible to realize that writing doesn't have to be painful. Uh, it can be like a thing that I do during work hours and then I get to also stop writing and go have my life. So that's my new setup since September and it's, amazing, but I still, I like to, I like to be around a murmur. So I'd still go to Seward Park Cafe mm -hmm. Vita <laughs> all the time. So come say hi. Even though I don't live in that neighborhood anymore because we moved, but I drive across town and I go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jane, how about you? I love this castle of yours. I feel like this is the, uh, these are goals you of you mine. Should, you should come over. We could do like a swap or when oh. I'm at the coffee shop, you can come use my castle. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Welcome. The cheese in Nori will be set up. I, yeah. It has a refrigerator. I'll stock it what? with cheese. <laughs> oh yeah. my god. What are you doing to me right now? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That, wow. It's true. I mean it. Um so I, I think I did finally get a desk somehow. Uh but 
I'll be honest, I write only in bed. Like, that's it. Uh, and I love it. I love, like, putting a gigantic comforter. Like, I just like, cr like, curling into this ball. It's not good for your back. Yeah, it's not the most ideal situation. But I pretty much will write until I fall asleep. Um, I just tire myself out. And I think there's something lovely about like writing till you're tired and just fall asleep and then I'll wake up and I'll try to write again. I've tried to write in, on a, at a desk or some sort of situation like that and I just end up going back into bed because I like to, I like to do everything in bed. <laughs> like I like to eat in bed, I like to watch TV in bed, like it's all the things happen in this like very, very cozy um, place. And I think it's funny because I grew up in a restaurant um, and so uh, most people grow up uh, maybe in a place that, like, you know, they they have, like, a room, um, you know, where they can, like, play their games or whatever um, kids do, <laughs> play their games. Um, but in the restaurant, I didn't have, I mean, it was a restaurant, and so, like, there was no place to really call your own, or I, I would usually take naps on, like, rice sacks and stuff, and I was grounded in the bathroom, you know, um, which is hilarious, because my mom would always be, like, there's an angry, my angry child is in there, just, like, go pee and then put her back. And uh, close the door, lock her in, and I'm like, they're always like, okay. And it's so funny that the customers are totally okay with this, but somehow I'm thinking about it. But like, I didn't have a plate, I didn't have a bed, I didn't go, I didn't have a room, a bedroom, right, at the restaurant. And so when I would get home of sorts, like, you know, it's never spent time in it. So, so there, I think there's something about a bedroom that's just like really nice to me, and it's like, that's my like cozy spot. Um, I write a lot actually in the bathtub. When I say that, I don't write literally. I think a lot of my writing happens just straight up in my head and I, don't, I never write it down. But I like to make the water as hot as humanly possible to the point where you're actually feeling kind of like, like, like dizzy and just like confused. And that's like the, when the best weirdest lines come to me. Um, and uh, even when I don't have, I, for a while I was like, I didn't have a bathtub. And so I actually bought like an inflatable bathtub, a kiddie pool, basically, <laughs> during the pandemic, and I would sit in this, like, you know, like, adult-sized puffed ramekin thing, and just, like, sit there <laughs> and just, like, dream up poems in the bathtub. Um, but, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I also am, a, you know, I'm a teacher, a professor, and um, when I ever ask my students to write in class, I write with them. You know, it's my way of sneaking in writing all the time, and I always share with them what I wrote to as they're writing and sharing and so like I sneak it in at times too but um, I don't know I feel like uh, also like next I've been doing a lot of uh, interdisciplinary art and like I mean what is I don't even know what writing is exactly anymore I'm starting to get really confused uh, which is funny because I did just write a book or something but um, I was just doing and I brought this up to with me because like I don't I just feel like I'm wanting to hold this all day but this is my mom's English Chinese dictionary. Um, and in it, um, she has some really interesting words she pulled out specifically to learn, such as postponement, marital, cleavage, unity, deny, retaliation, marriage vow, legislation. Let's see what else is in here. Literally, that's an interesting word. Fragile, abandonment. Um, and so I kind of want to basically take this and like write a poem, I think maybe out of the words that she wrote, and then I will photocopy this and like pulp it into a blender um, and make homemade paper. And then I will put my mom's seeds in it and then plant it and a plant will grow. So like this is what I'm up to these days. So. <laughs> I don't even know, and you can't do that in bed or anything. There's no really an environment. It's so guard. I guess for that project, it would be like garden kitchen area or a garden bed area, oh, possibly in Lindy's backyard. Um, yeah, you want some eggplant? <laughs> eggplant poems. Yes. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Lindy West and Jane Wong, thank you so much for your words, for your work. Congratulations, Jane, on your forthcoming memoir. We can't wait to read it. Um, Lindy will be signing books out there. We'll see you all out there in a few minutes. Thanks for being Thanks. here. So. Thank you.